Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, attending the Zoltfilm's presentation. Um, I'm quite happy to take questions during the presentation. Uh, I feel it breaks it up, but uh, hopefully it will flow reasonably well and, and you'll be engaged enough to, to wait till the end. Um, there will be a chance for questions at the end, so um, don't feel that you have to raise your hand. Um, let's just start straight in then. Uh, so, Foams, uh, who are we? Uh, first, some legal disclaimers. Uh, we always do that. Uh, I'd like to just talk about our business. Zotfoams is uh, a company that's been around for an awful long time. Actually, our genesis goes back to the 1920s. Um, and uh, there's a lot of things changed since the 1920s, but particularly, I guess, in the last five or six years, um, our strategy has really started to show through in the results of the business. Um, we are a maker of uh, technical materials, uh, foams. Uh, we use a unique technology. There's no one else in the world doing this or anything uh, really very like it at all. Um, and that gives us the ability to foam materials other people can't foam, or it gives us the ability to make foams which are highly differentiated. Um, we do uh, look at a range of markets across the globe, and uh, we are high barriers to entry. Uh, the technology we use is uh, quite capital intensive. There's some IP, there's an awful lot of know-how in there, and therefore, we feel that we have a position not just in a, a market which are growing, but a defensible position in the business. Uh, we're headquartered in the UK. If you want to come down and kick some assets in Croydon, uh, I'm sure that can be arranged. We have about 500 people globally, although the majority, about 350, are based in the UK at the moment. Um, we think about our business in four main product groups. Uh, Azo polyolefin foams, which are made from uh, say standard commodity thermoplastics like you'd find in a Tesco's carrier bag or a milk carton, something like that. So we're taking common or garden polymers, applying unique technology and foaming them to create something quite unusual. Um, we also make Zotec uh, high performance products. So using the same technology, the same nitrogen expansion, the same asset base, the same people, uh, foaming plastics which have differential characteristics. They may be um, fire retardant, they may be chemical resistant, they may be higher temperature performance. Um, and those attributes end up with foams which are truly unique. Um, the benefit of that for our business is that we are moving ahead of the competition, we are creating markets, and sometimes markets or opportunities which are fairly fast moving. Um, so we expect higher growth in these businesses, we'll talk about by that later, um, and also higher margins. Um, the ability to make higher or premium priced products in the same asset base with the same labor force means your drop through margins are better. Um, we also use the Zotec products to make T-fit insulation parts. This might look uh, quite innocuous, a little uh, piece of plastic used to insulate a pipe, but if you're in a biotech pharmaceutical clean room or semiconductor clean room, this can be uh, quite an important and high value item. We'll talk about that a bit later as well. And then we also have technology licensing. Um, the technology licensing is only about 2% or 3% of our sales at the moment. Um, it's an unusual business. Actually, it's quite easy to understand uh, when we get through, and I'll explain a bit about that. Uh, but it is a business which does require a bit of uh, care and attention to understand. If you look at it, it looks like uh, you know a, a business which is just losing money. Thank you very much. Why would you even do this? Um, I hope to convince you that's, that's not the case. Um, the business we think about really, as I said, we have these four product groups. Um, coming from two main technologies. The autoclave technology, and you can see that drives the polyolefin and HPP business. We make blocks of foam, or a sheet of foam. Um, a sheet of foam will sell anywhere between about 180 pounds a cubic meter, up to about 4,000 pounds a cubic meter. That's a lot of money 
for something which is a, is a, is a value-added plastic. Um, I'm quite proud of that. It's, it's, we create a lot of value for our downstream customers. Um, <coughs> but it is all based on this unique autoclave technology. Mucell is extrusion technology. We are basically using other people's machines, licensing our IP, licensing our technology to reduce plastic content in common or garden parts. We are not making foams or, pl or plastic packaging. So an example of that, uh, for those of you who've been around a few years and followed us, this is a Unilever Dove bottle, and you will see that you know, if you go down to Boots the Chemist, this is on sale, um, and this adopts Mucell technology. And by doing so, rather than a bottle which is made of solid plastic, it's a bottle which is made of foam plastic. It doesn't look like it, take it home, cut it up, get your microscope out, you might see some bubbles in there. But actually what we're doing is reducing by about 15% the plastic content of this bottle. That's great for the environment, it's great for cost savings, and over time we get the benefit because we share those savings. Some selected clients, um, most of these are end users. Zotfoams tends to be a bit further back in the supply chain. We're creating blocks of foam. So we want people to use them for their unique properties. Um, and although people use our technology, mostly there are one or sometimes two people in between to create that plastic part from our foam. An example here, this is a, a, an automotive part, a gasket, made by a compression thermoforming process. So basically just heat and pressure, turning it into something which is used, you'll find in a car. Um, why would they want our technology on this? Well, we're lighter, it doesn't smell, and uh, actually the consistency of our foaming process means that the person making this product puts less time and effort into making sure that they've got a compliant gasket, and that's important for them. It means their asset and labor efficiency improves. So these are good reasons to buy Zoat Foams. Um, globally, we are located uh, in the glamorous South London, uh, near Croydon, the head office. We have three locations in the US. The main facility is in Kentucky, where we've recently invested uh, just over $50 million in new capacity. Um, we also have a facility in Oklahoma, which is much smaller foam cutting operation. We have our IP licensing out in Boston. That business came out of Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and, uh, and that's why that's located up there. That's the technology licensing. And uh, we actually operate mostly sales and marketing, but small foam finishing operation to make the installation tubes in, uh, in China. The business, um, as you can see, by business unit, the polyolefin, the azote business, um, is about 75% of the business. Our high performance products, uh, about 25%, and uh, a new sale tagged on the end, a couple of percent of sales. Um, we see across the industries a very diversified business. Um, even within our you know, biggest section, which is product protection, we've got a, a real variety of different applications. <coughs> so we estimate, you know, we have about 250 to 300 customers just for the Azote business. Um, our, I know our biggest, uh, our biggest customer in the UK claims to have 3,000 customers using our product. So that's how quickly it fragments and diversifies out. Um, only about 15% of our sales are in the UK. Um, about a third in continental Europe, 25% in North America, and 20% in Asia. So quite a global business, uh, from mainly served from this base in the UK. Our strategy is pretty simple. We've got a unique technology, we make products which are highly differentiated, and we're looking at organic growth. We, we need to focus somewhat on certain markets, simply because there's so much opportunity. So when we're looking at the end markets, a lot of our business is done through our, our customers. We help them sell our product rather than go direct to the end users. And in some markets, we go direct to the end users ourselves and try and create that pull through. Uh, mostly 
However, we are not making products for the end users. We are supplying materials into customer channels and they can develop the business. Um, so we're looking for these sustained levels of high, uh, sustained high levels of organic growth. And over time, that mix enrichment, as the high performance products are growing more quickly and they are higher margin, over time the asset utilization should shift to that higher margin portfolio. The business is driven really by three main mega trends. Um, if we look environmental, look, foams are lightweight. The whole reason for foams being there is performance at lightweight, using less material. Um, environmental trends are clear. Okay. But we're also looking at weight saving in cars, weight saving in planes, insulation, energy saving. Um, all of these things have an environmental angle and people are genuinely switching. People are looking at making cars lighter, not because they want to be lighter, but electric vehicles, if they want a, a, um, a range of 400 miles, it's not just the battery they've got to think about, how do they make the car lighter? So foam technology and lightweighting technology is in there. Uh, regulation, increasing pressure to drive higher standards in things like fire safety, personal protection, um, good for our business. We operate at the high end of these markets. And then demographics. Um, normally what people think about with demographics is an aging population. And that's certainly part of the story with us. We do sell materials for medical applications in particular. But more we see a wealthier population, a wealthier middle class looking at higher growth rates in let's say high to medium end cars. Um, high to medium end or very high end sportswear, um, an urbanization, an ur um, more urban population, definitely consuming more packaged food. Whether that's good for them or the environment, I, I don't know, but that's what's happening. And certainly, you know, we are in some markets that benefit from that. If we look at the insulation tubes, we're moving out of clean rooms for biotech pharmaceutical and into food processing, dairy processing. Big growth in these markets, certainly in Asia. And we're looking to get products and capitalize in these trends. So we are backed by general mega trends, although I would say, particularly in the high performance products, we're looking at disruptive technology and disruptive technology in very large markets. And so it's all about market share, not necessarily market growth. We have been investing quite a lot of money recently. Um, you can go away and, and, and look at this slide at your leisure, but the bottom line is from the end of 2017 to the end of 2020, we will have added about 60, 65% onto our capacity. Now that should allow us to grow by more than that because of the mix enrichment or have the capacity to grow by more than that, certainly. We need to see how our strategy you know, delivers. But uh, you know, that's what the investment's all about. It's all about organic growth and investing for that growth. Our main factory in the UK has seen some of that investment as we make more high performance products. Our factory in the US has been the, the major beneficiary. <laughs> We've invested almost 50 million and it'll be almost 60 million by the time we finish, dollars that is. And then Poland, we're opening a facility uh, scheduled to come online second half 2020. And we actually raised some money back in uh, May to do that. That global investment um, will change a bit the geographical balance, but not hugely. It's, it's lined up against our major markets. We're not talking about get, getting into different markets to justify that investment. It's lined up with existing markets. Um, and then just to show you some idea of the capital intensity of our business, this is some investment we're making in the UK at the moment. You can, you can see here one of the vessels being delivered into the UK, and uh, these are not Lego men, these are actually construction workers down here watching it squeeze into, into a new building. Um, so we are you know, really looking at an asset-backed business. We own our land in, in the UK, we own our land in North America, where the big assets are. 
we own our land in Poland. Um, when these assets get put in, they're not moving. And so it's important strategically to get them the right quality assets in the right places. The other businesses, the kind of value added manufacturing technology licensing, not capital intensive at all, and therefore located in rented buildings that we could move out of as and when we want. The unique technology, just a little bit more on that, is, is important. Um, really three major, major stages of a process. First, we make a plastic sheet. Then we put nitrogen gas in it using very high temperatures and pressures. And then in a final stage, we heat that plastic sheet up and the gas that's in there forces the plastic to stretch and create a foam. A very simple process. And the simplicity of that process kind of belies some of the barriers to entry. Um, people know what we do, but they recognize that it's very technical. When you're operating at pressures up to 10,000 PSI, uh, so that's about 300 times the pressure of your car tire, uh, you're operating at temperatures up to 250 Celsius, and you know vessels bigger than this room, it's pretty, pretty tricky. Um, those barrier to entries are very real. And, and actually, even when Zoltfoams are investing in our own technology, it feels like, um, you know, I wouldn't say it's difficult, but, uh, you know, there are definitely things that we have to pay very close attention to to get it right. The other technology that we, uh, that we use is MuCell, and I think it's worth just spending a little bit of time on MuCell technology. Although it's not today a big part of our business, we see it as one of the growth places for the future. Um, and that technology is different. Um, what we're doing is helping other people optimize their technology. So we are mainly focused in consumer packaging. It's all extrusion based. So you will find things like bottles, um, yogurt pots, microwave dishes, um, films for things like if you buy like laundry detergent bags or stand-up pouches with soup in, you know, these film pouches, you know, all using extruded plastic. Um, and basically, you're putting plastic in the, the, the front end, mixing it in a screw, heating it, and out the far end, through a die, making the product you want. Our technology, basically, through gas injection and a kit, piece of kit on the end, puts nitrogen gas into that mix. And that nitrogen gas displaces some of the plastic. And by displacing some of the plastic in a very controlled and carefully managed manner, you can reduce the plastic content of a, of a, common, plastic, a common packaging article. Typically, we would say about 15%, although we do see opportunities. We do see reality of going lighter than that. And the obvious question is, well, how do we, what's the business model? Technology works. It does take a while for people to do this, to learn to do this and get the packaging adopted downstream. So the brand owner, et cetera. Um, and that, that's been a bit of a barrier to, to, to overcome, but certainly the technology works. Everyone that's using the technology proves it works. We've saved hundreds of tons of uh, plastic over the years. And uh, that's direct money out of the pockets of people that don't have to buy the plastic. So that, that technology is there and definitely works in that way. Um, the business, just to give you some idea of the size, um, I have the 2017 numbers on the bottom here, kind of highlights. Uh, 70 million revenue, which was 22% up on the previous year. All organic growth. Uh, prof up 22% to just under 9 million. And uh, we do pay a dividend, 4 pence dividend on earnings of 16 pence. So very well covered. A lot of money left to reinvest back in the business, uh, which we are doing. The half year saw a continuation of that. We saw 12% revenue growth. Uh, or 17% in constant currency, um, and we saw our profit before tax up 20% again. Um, and then we released our third quarter earnings kind of update, trading update, where 
we saw 18% constant currency, and that's for the full nine months. It's not for the quarter, it's full nine months. So continuing that, that strong organic growth. Um, and you can see from the high performance products, which are now 26% of the sales, that that's what's driving the top line and, and the bottom line. We are continuing to invest not just in capital and equipment, but people to manage the business, to manage the risks, R&D, and market development. If we take a look at uh, some of the key metrics we look at, and you can find these on our website, we look at operating margin, which is generally grown or, or relatively stable as we continue to invest. Uh, we look at the polyolefin foams growth, which is the ASO market, and that's where we're targeting twice GDP. Up until, well, really from part of the way through 16 to 18, we've been operating capacity constrained. That constraint was removed really around the half year of 2018 as our US facility stage one came online. And so we expect that uh, perhaps to, to open up a bit. Um, our non-polyolefin share of, of, of revenue, the higher margin businesses should grow as a percentage of our mix and that mix enrichment. And we look at capital employed in two ways. One, straight as it comes, which is the kind of lower line here. And then the upper line is, if we take out the capital that's not yet in use. It takes quite a while for us to invest in a new plant. And until it's up and running, um, it's, I think, unreasonable to say that it should be returning money to us. And so in recognizing that gap, we publish two measures. This, the upper one showing what happens if we take that money out that's not yet in use or not yet planned to be in use. Um, over the, the sort of longer term, we can see um, what our, our, our growth rates are and the revenue split, et cetera. Um, but basically, polyolefins, azote business, growing fairly nicely. HPP, very strong growth and operating profit picking up. And MuCell, decent growth, um, losing more and more money as we grow that business. Um, the one maybe to spend a bit of time on is, is MuCell just quickly here, which is the way our business model works in selling foam is we sell foam, we make a profit. It's fairly standard manufacturing strategy. The way MuCell works is we license technology, but we don't take a share of the profit. We don't sell a technology license and get money on day one. We are taking a share of the savings. And so all of the costs of MuCell to develop the technology, the cost of a customer acquisition, teaching them how to use our technology, is all a cost up front. That comes with a signed license. And that licensee, when they put the technology to use, saves plastic and then pays us a royalty. And that royalty income will come over the life of the contract, which is typically around 12 years. So what we're seeing with MuCell is a whole lot of upfront costs of technology development and customer acquisition. And what we're not seeing yet is the full benefit of the income stream. And if we stop that business today, we would be sitting on a clutch of contracts that would be worth money over the next five years or 10 years up to the, the end of the last contract. Um, that's not intent. We believe that we want to continue more and more licensing, but over time, those contracts should mature, people should be using the technology more and more, and the license income should rise to give us a profit in that business. But it is a different business model, so the optic on the P&L looks quite an odd optic, and it's one of the things that at least partly distorts <laughs> our, um, our P ratio in, in, in the business. So, just in summary, uh, the investment case is unique technology, organic growth, and mix enrichment over time. That, that's Zote Foams. Some of the questions we typically get asked are here. Um, I'm very happy to take any of these as questions or, or run through them, but raw materials, I think it's, it's beneficial just to cover raw materials. 
We buy bulk raw materials, the, the base polymer, before any additives like color or anything like that. Around about 20% of our selling price is bulk materials. So as those material prices fluctuate up and down, sometimes the oil price, sometimes in supply and demand, we basically ignore it. We're not passing on raw materials. We are an engineering company, a technology company that adds a lot of value. And we want our customers to look at that and say, how do I sell Zoopfilm's products, not how do I worry about costs and pricing? So we may see a bit of a squeeze or, or opening up of margins in the short term fluctuations. In the high performance products, the polymer pricing doesn't really um, react like that. It's fairly stable. They put price increases through, but it tends to be fairly stable. Um, we raised money in May, uh, just over 20 million. That's for growth, uh, partly working capital, but mainly to help finance our facility in Poland, which uh, would be just over 20 million investment and uh, up and running middle of, uh, towards the end, mid to end 2020. Why is Mucell losing money? I think, I hope I've explained that. It's, it's a timing thing. Um, how do we safeguard IP when investing in China? Uh, we make the tubes. We make these uh, insulation <coughs> tubes for biotech, et cetera, in China. We make them in China because there's a big market in China. There's a lot of investment in biotech, pharma, IP, and we want to be there. And you can take a sheet of foam and turn it into any size or any shape tube like that. So you don't have to, it minimizes your working capital, gives you the most flexibility, it disintermediates distribution, uh, but it means you've got to manufacture the tubes in country. Actually, the capital equipment's common, I wouldn't say common or garden, but it's very low cost, easily replicated. The technology lies in the foam. And the only place you can get the foam is Zoot Foams in Croydon. So as long as we control the distribution of the raw material, we've got protection of IP in China. We don't need to worry about people copying this. Our competitors, actually in the high performance products, we don't really have direct competitors. People offer different solutions to footwear. We've got a, we signed a deal with Nike a couple of years ago. You can see that, you know, growing our HPP. Lots of people make foams for footwear, but we are at high end. People make foams or other parts for aviation, but it's different competitors. So it's a real mixed bag of <coughs> what people do. Um, in the azo polyolefin market, it tends to be low capital cost, low barrier to entry, um, fairly me too technology that you could go out and buy for two or three million pounds to get a small line up and running. Um, we compete with that technology all day, every day across the globe. Um, we're a premium product. We charge a premium price. We give a premium product. Okay, there's not much change in that over the last few years. Um, our barriers to entry, I hope I've explained that, primarily capital know-how and uh, increasingly specification as we get more technical in some of these technical markets. Um, R&D, we spend a decent amount on R&D, about 2.5% of turnover, um, which when you couple that with business development and, and market creation costs is, is you know, a decent amount of money, but that's where the growth's coming from. Uh, we own all our own assets. I've explained that we, you know, the capital intensity um, will sit in, in the places where the big assets are, UK, Kentucky, and Poland. David. And then... Sorry to interrupt. Sorry. You invited questions, yeah, and I just, sorry, sorry, I just, ahead. I just had one yeah. right there. Uh, do you employ an army of people in white coats, or do you um, outsource your R, R and D uh, to, to universities, to independent research labs? No, we, we don't outsource any any R and D. In Musel, um, sometimes we work with our customers on specific applications, but we don't outsource any R and D, and we don't generally do paid R and D. People come to us and say, can you do this for us? We'll pay you some money. Uh, usually along with that comes, oh, and by the way, we'll own your IP. Uh, no, that's not us. So it's all in-house. 
yeah the areas you're active in um like packaging electric vehicles aircraft you mentioned um, um sold for for sports shoes those are exactly the same areas where graphene is now starting to get into do you see that as a threat or do you even try to incorporate yourself or yeah i mean i think we we we're we've got a continual program of looking at additives so graphene in itself is is more an additive to an enhancement rather than a replacement um, i think we feel that our technology can you know can can stand up uh, like for like with anyone else's technology if you then look at what can you add to further enhance that yes there are a number of additives so graphene is one of them i think we're just seeing uh, the start of uh, the possibilities of graphene it's a bit tricky to work with um, and when you're using common assets for different products you don't want just to throw some graphene in and see what happens you need to be aware of that but uh, absent that we, we can we can deal with that if we can see a benefit um, two two quite different questions um, one we're all getting increasingly concerned about plastic in the environment is there an impact is there likely to be an impact of that on your business? And the second one is financial. Do you have plans for another fundraise in the next two years, three years? Well, I'll deal with that first. That, that's a no. There are no plans for another fundraise. Um, obviously, if the business changes, if a big opportunity comes along, because we're working on a whole series of opportunities that, that would require that, then you know, I, I, I reserve the right to change that. But, but no, not at the moment. Um, plastics in the environment, there's, def there's a lot of talk about plastics in the environment and generally people are talking about um, single-use plastics, uh, plastic packaging or whatever. Almost <coughs> all, I would say almost all of Zotfoam's plastic that we make is permanent or semi-permanent. It's part of a product or part of, it's not, you know, it's not disposable in that sense. And so it's designed to be hard wearing or stand up. You know, if you, if you buy a car and uh, this is going to degrade within six months, you'd be pretty, uh, you know, disgruntled, I'd say. Um, same with a plane, an aircraft. You don't want the, the parts to, to, to fall away, etc. So I don't see a major impact in, in that part of our business. Um, although people do... We do get increasing number of inquiries about how do we reuse, recycle, etc. these products, and we deal with that quite happily. Um, on the Mucell business, I think it should be positive. I mean, the packaging world is huge, and, and even at the most aggressive, let's say, reuse um, or environmental um, push against packaging, you're still just slowing down the growth for the next few years. And so Mucell technology can take plastic out of that, you know, save plastic, use less. It's completely compatible with recycling and, and uh, post-consumer plastic uh, use. And so I see that as positive for Mucell. Um, quick question about the link, possible link between innovation and recruitment um, or recruitment of talent. Uh, assuming you're continuing to grow and assuming innovation is, or engineering innovation is con continuing to be important. Where do you look for talent? Is it from the universities or elsewhere? And how do you compete for it when you're, you know, yeah. going up against bigger companies? Um, if you'd asked me that three or four years ago, I would have said it's, it's really tough. Um, now it's, it tends not to be. Uh, Zofoams are doing some really interesting things. And that actually attracts the interest of, of people who are, bright, ambitious, etc. And actually being based, if I can just look at the UK for a moment, being based in, in London, there aren't many people in London that are making things. Um, and therefore, you know, we get a lot of people from <laughs> hailing from the Southeast who, who have gone to university in Manchester or, you know, or, or who have come to like Imperial College or whatever and want to come back and work in the Southeast. And uh, we are a, an attractive proposition for that. So certainly at the at the younger end. Um, medium, you know, I, I'd say mid-career, it's a bit more difficult. People with families, 
tend not to want to relocate to the southeast just because of the cost penalty. And so that we, we struggle a little bit more there, but it's certainly manageable. David, specifically with the Bucell business, you mentioned that you're investing um, with the hope of getting royalties through um, down, downstream. Yeah. Are, are you covering the costs in those royalty contracts? And also, is there a, a limit on the upside potential to those contracts as well? Um, there's typically no limit on the upside. So if, uh, if, if someone converts one production line or 10 production lines, they'll pay 10 times as much. Um, and because we are sharing the savings, the more they're paying us, I mean, we, we typically take a cut of about 15% of the savings. And therefore, you know, they're making seven times as much money as, as we're making and jolly happy about it too, usually. Um, are we covering the cost? It's always tricky because when you go into a relationship with someone who's using your technology, everyone's got the right intent. And sometimes it doesn't quite work out that way. So we don't have any clawback if, if they don't implement the technology. Um, occasionally, we will have commitments up front where there's a minimum fee. Uh, but I think we've got to use good judgment with, uh, with big companies who are putting resource in of their own. Um, you know, it's not free for them to go through this process. Then... Um, Typically, you want to start on a, a kind of positive goodwill note, and occasionally that doesn't work, which is a bit frustrating. But I think um, the alternative to try and negotiate up front a fee is a very frustrating thing for everyone and tends not to, to go down very well. We've got confidence in our technology. So. David, we're at time now. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.